Well, good morning. I want you to go to your Bible, please, in the book of Matthew. I want you to look at chapter 26 and chapter 28 for just a moment. We've been in a series called Mountaintop Experiences. We've talked about a mountain of faith with Abraham was commanded and asked to sacrifice his son, which the Lord stayed his hand and protected him, but he saw he had faith. We talked about a mountain of direction with the Ten Commandments where the Lord just gave some very basic, simple rules for life. We talked about a mountain of transformation. There was the transfiguration where Peter, James, and John were never the same. They were truly transformed from that as well. The mountain of forgiveness, we talked last week about the mountain Calvary, where Jesus hung on the cross to forgive us of our sins. But today I want to talk about the mountain of challenge, a mountain of challenge, how important, how real this is for all of us. In Matthew 26, just a simple place here. Verse number 31 The Lord has instituted now that last supper, and here in the process, he said, this very night, you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But what I want you to see is verse 32, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. That's the key phrase for now. Then Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. And of course, you know the story there, and the Lord says, I tell you the truth, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And the other disciples said the same. We, we know that story. But what I want you to pick up on is verse number 32. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Now, Galilee is the area that Jesus would have spent most of his ministry in. is in the northern part of Israel, uh, it was there by the a northern section, the Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee, forming on the eastern border. A lot of things that went into that as well. In this area, in his public ministry, 19 of the 32 parables were taught somewhere in Galilee, and 25 of his 33 miracles were performed in this area. This would be his most familiar area to him. There he would grow up in Nazareth, obviously, one of the major cities of, Nazareth, of Galilee as well. It was from there that he called his disciples. These would be men either from there or were as a part of that there. The, his first miracle was there. In this, though, he says this. He simply says, I want you to meet me at Galilee. Now, in this, we're going to find this was a special area. Peter was actually in, in in Matthew 26, later on, as he was standing by the enemy's fire there, the enemy's camp, she recognized him as one of those, one of the followers of Christ, and said, even your accent gives you away. I thought, well, hallelujah. He has a Texan accent right there. <laughs> even your accent gives you away. There was something special about that, and one writer says this, the entire province of Galilee was encircled with a halo of holy associations connected with the life, the works, the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, in this, it says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news, healing the diseased, all of the he was all through that. Now, many believe that the particular area where this would have occurred would be where he's going to meet, meet his men in a little bit. That's where we're going to get to Matthew 28. Turn over there. This will be a extremely familiar passage to you in Matthew 28, beginning in verse number 18 up there. Remember, he just got through saying in a previous section there at that Lord's Supper, he said, I'm gonna, at the time will come, I'm going to meet you in the mountain. I'm going to meet you at the place. Many believe it would be Mount Arbel. Mount Arbel would be the tallest of that region there. Uh, it's, it's basically... It's located on the west side of the Sea of Galilee, the tallest mountain around that particular area, rises 1,200 feet above. Now, in, so, in doing so, he says, now, guys, here it is. He's predicting his death. Peter says, and that's not going to happen. I'm going to die with you. If I have to, I'll never deny you. We know that story. Then he comes over here, then to Matthew 28, where we know it as the Great Commission. But I want you to see where he sets his foot in this sense. 
When he said, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. Now, they would have been familiar with the area that he was most familiar with, that he was comfortable with, where he was giving those disciples, he would give instructions, he would teach, he would use. That was a mountain of significance, and they could look across the Sea of Galilee. It could look for miles and miles and miles and miles and see lots of people, lots of things, lots of land out that direction. That's really why I wanted to bring it up to you. In this sense here, it is, it is a place where we believe truly this was where the Great Commission was given, Mount Arbel. Hmm. Well, in this, Mount Arbel was, was a place of this Great Commission. There you would see such places as Magnola. Well, we got to stay there, obviously. There's other places, Bethsaida. Uh, probably he would look down the area where he fed the 5,000, fed the 4,000. Now, in this, this mountain area, this Mount Arbel, would be the, one of the last times he would ever meet with his men. And he's given him his last instructions. Now, we have to be very careful because the words we say are important. What we say, people take, take to heart many times. These are the very last words of commissioning of Christ. So I've called this a mountain of challenge. He is challenging his men. These are 11 men. Remember, Judas is out of the picture. He's challenging these 11 men with a worldwide mission project to take the gospel around the entire world from this very comfortable setting on this mountain area. Now, how far up, how far down, I don't know. Just the fact this is a place where they were comfortable. It was not unique in the sense of it was strange or odd to them. They were comfortable with that. This was the comfort area for Jesus where he had most spent most of his ministry and most of his life in this. So I've called it truly a mountain of challenge. In this, he challenges his men. Now we say, well, I can quote the Great Commission and, and I know that. But can we apply that with a challenge? In this, he said, all authority. Let me go back over here. Look with me in verse number 18 again. 16, I'm sorry. The 11 disciples went to Galilee to, to the mountain where he told them to go. When, he saw, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. There you go again. Then Jesus came to them and said, watch these words, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, let me put it to you pretty simple. What he says is, I'm the boss, okay? He's affirming who he is, all the authority, the entire world, the universe is at my beck and call. All the authority on heaven and on earth, everything about this has been given unto me. I think we've got to do this and say, you know what, I need to take this Seriously, because God has given them a moment, a time of challenge. So, well, that was for them. No, it's for us. It was recorded for us to carry with us today. And I want to bring us a mountain of challenge to our church family. He says very clearly in this, in this passage, he said this. He said, therefore, go. Now, when the, you see in the Bible, when it says therefore, it's there for a reason. You got me there? It's there for a reason. Therefore, Go. I put in my notes simply this, get up, quit sitting, therefore go. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, to go. Here's a mountain of challenge. Now, these are ragtag fishermen, tax collectors, guys that were not the top of your class, so to speak. They were everyday working men, and God used them in a miraculous way. God can still use Regular, everyday people in a miraculous way, by the way. He can use people wherever he calls you from, he will equip you to do the job. And in doing so now, he challenges them. He just said, now guys, here's what I, I think you'd like to do. I mean, you know, you might want to think about this, but y'all go home and pray about this. Hadn't found that anywhere. He simply says this, therefore, go. Get up and go. Here's a mountain of challenge. These are the men, these 11 men, are gonna be commissioned to take the gospel around the world. Now, there are other believers, there are other followers, but they are not the leaders. They're not the ones who's gonna step out. Peter's one who's already, he's made the mistake, he's messed up before. He's not gonna be perfect along the way, but he's gonna lead the way through the book of Acts. We're gonna find him opening the doors to a Gentile ministry before Paul takes that over. In this sense, he says, go therefore into all the world 
All the world. Make it very clearly when it says this. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, of all peoples, of all backgrounds, of all cultures. Making disciples. Making disciples means this. We preach Jesus to them. It is a truly a change in their heart. It's not a change in direction. It's a change in their lives. When we begin to make disciples, we help them to get saved. That's a Bible word. All of us in this room say, well, I know that word. I need you to nail it down even more. When you're saved, you're separated. You've been called from to. You've been called from sin into a life that God wants you to live. You've been saved for a purpose. Therefore, he says, go to all the nations. You say, well, that's the worldwide it really is. How many billion people on this earth nowadays? There's a lot of them. And most of them have moved to North Texas on 35 Highway. <laughs> Amen. But every culture, every, every, every dialect, everything you can imagine has moved around the world. And I don't believe, watch this, I do not believe that the challenge has stopped. God didn't say, well, guys, when you get finished, you're done. No. The challenge has now been perpetuated, moved over to us. Therefore, go and get people saved. You say, well, I'm not, I mean, I'm not that person. Well, let me help you something. You need to be that person. You know why? Because some of these people that I'm talking about are your family. Their eternity hangs in the balance. So, well, you know, that's the preacher's job. Wonderful. I, I'll take that responsibility. But where are they today? They're not here listening to me. They're not online listening to me or any other preacher or anyone else like that. Where are they? They're somewhere else today in life. They've not even considered eternity. They've not even considered their destiny. Somewhere along the way, you've got to make them aware that there is a destiny that, to be, that will be had, an eternity that you'll be spending. Before you can get somebody saved, you've got to get them lost. They've got to come to the part that I need God. Right now, they don't need God in their mind. They've got money. They've got an education. They've got a house. They've got a job. They are self-sustaining. They, they can do what they want to do. Until that day, they will stand before a holy and a righteous God. And on that day, they will need God. Then it's too late. And I say, we'll go to all the nations. And we think about the mission field about around the world. When I was a teenager, I thought the mission field meant Africa. Really did. But the mission field is just simply across the street. The mission field, it may not be someone you know, but I need to drive this home. It may be somebody that you are personally connected to. Just out in the atrium a while ago, I was visiting with someone, and they said, you know, in recent days, we've lost a lot of folks in our community to death, age, illness, sickness. And that will continue to happen. And when that moment comes that their heart stops beating, their breath stops blowing, they're gone. And there are no second chances. There is no bargaining with God. So the challenge is, he gave these men on that mountaintop a comfortable setting for them. Go get them. This is a comfortable setting for us. You've heard this. You've heard me preach the Great Commission a million times. But I will do it a million times more. A young man, well, I shouldn't say young, an older gentleman pastor who helped start this church in 1964, Jim Angel, was the pastor of Lakeland Baptist. We were the first mission church of Lakeland. Eventually, he became a church builder. He went to New Mexico and built buildings for churches. But there was a time that he was a camp director of Camp Copus, our Baptist camp just up the street. And while at his home one evening, he had a massive heart attack. When the paramedics got to him, they were doing everything they could to save his life. They were not successful, but between his home and the hospital, my friend Jim was witnessing to those men. He's about to step into eternity with Jesus, and he's telling those young firefighters and paramedics about Jesus. He's quoting the Great Commission. 
He's that close. And yet he's that concerned about those men who were tending to him. He said, fellas, don't worry about me. I know where I'm going. I want to know where you're going. And we said the same thing. Well, I know where I'm going. But what about those that we don't know? We don't know their destiny. So, well, pastor, it's a personal thing. No, it's not personal. It's not private. It's a public commission. God gave that commission to those men. It's a challenge. He gave it to all of us to go and get them saved, to get them baptized. We need to keep that baptism water stirred up. Right now, it's stale and it stinks. Because I need to stir it up. Baptism doesn't save, but it's the affirmation, the confirmation, the follow-up of somebody trusting Christ. They are identifying with the Lord. Then we teach them to observe all things, the Bible says. We teach them small groups, Bible studies, Sunday school classes, one-on-one, Sunday morning worship, whatever it takes. And I believe this mountain of challenge goes out to every one of us, young or old. And the challenge is because the Bible says the fields are wide into harvest, but the laborers are few. I'll be real honest with you. Right now, in American culture, the church is losing ground. And you can speculate, and I can speculate on a lot of reasons why, but I can tell you this, the our, our world around us is exploding with growth and the vast majority are lost and headed to a devil's hell. If we read the signs of the times and read through the scripture, it looks like the coming of the Lord may be any time now. You never know. I'm not waiting on any more prophecy to be fulfilled. All I'm waiting on is the sound of the trumpet. And when, we, when we're gone, there's gonna be people left behind. When we're gone, this church packed, this building will be packed out. Some of you may even be here because you don't know Christ. But I promise you, be some of your family who said, Well, Mama went to church. They invited me to Sunday school and Bible study and Sunday and vacation Bible school. Maybe I can go now and get some help. It'll be way too late then. There'll be no second chances. There's not another revelation. I believe it's a genuine, genuine challenge. Are you up for the challenge is the question. And it seems like the odds are stacked against us. There's more of them than us. And seemingly it's been that way. But watch this. Jesus started with only 11 men. Well, he tried 12 and one was a, was a flake out on him. You know that. He got 11 guys. They were not PhDs. They were not masters of theology. These guys were masters of being fishermen and tax collectors. These were guys who simply had a passion and a burden to follow Christ. And when, when Jesus was gone, they disbanded for a while till God brought them back in and said, now get on with it. My question was, can we really make a difference? Can we make a dent in this lost population? The honest answer is this. We may not be able to reach the masses. But those we do reach will be saved and eternally grateful. I can't reach them all, but I might can reach that one. The pastor, we're in the hot of the summer, man. You know, people on vacation are traveling. And, yeah. And wherever you go, whatever you do, there's always an opportunity to talk about Jesus. You never know. The numbers are there. The Bible says the harvest is white. It's ready to be picked. But there's just not enough laborers in the field. It's like two shoe salesmen. They went overseas to sell shoes to a native group. The first guy calls back and he said, it's no use. No one here wears shoes. The other calls back and says, man, send more shoes. Everybody here needs some. It just depends on how you look at it. You can say it's a, the odds are against this pastor. We can't do anything about it. Or you can say, send more help. I want you to go with me on a journey for a moment and think about your family, your children, your grandchildren, your babies, grandbabies, your brothers, your sisters, your moms and dads. Do they have Christ in their heart right now? 
Do they have Jesus in their heart right this very moment? Well, Pastor, I don't know. It's time to find out. It's time to find out. And I realize sometimes talking to family is tough because they know you. They know your background. They, they may even think you're a hypocrite, but you're still commanded to go. I don't think my mother's watching online, so I'm going to tell this story on her parents. My grandparents, Bowery, Ma and Paul. They didn't pass away until just a few years ago. I was very blessed to have grand- grandparents and even great-grandparents in my life. I knew the Wells family. I knew of their, of their faith, but I didn't know of the Bowery family. I just didn't know. I assumed so. But one day, the burden was so heavy on me, my, and I just couldn't take it anymore. And I went and I said, now, i got to talk to y'all. I'm talking to you as a grandson, but I'm, I'm also talking to you as a Christian. I need to know where do you stand with Jesus? Have you been saved? What's going on? And both of them sitting on that old couch just lit up. <laughs> they said, well, yeah, I've been saved. Got saved out there years ago outside of Crumb, Texas. Sure did. Matter of fact, we got baptized out there in the old Hickory Creek. It was just a few years ago, Miss Helen Inman brought me a picture of a baptism that occurred at the Hickory Creek. I couldn't tell, but my grandparents very likely could have been in that picture. There were hundreds of people standing at the creek side. And I walked away that day, and I felt so relieved. And the time came that they passed, and as a grandson, I was honored to preach their funerals. But rather than just saying they were just good folks or good grandparents, is all I could have said. But more than that, I said, but they knew Jesus. They didn't darken the doors every time the church doors are open. I get that. I wish they would have. But most importantly, they had Jesus in their heart. So I want to just finish them by saying, let's get real personal with this. I want you to choose a person and to begin praying for that person. Jesus left these men with a challenge. I'm leaving you with a challenge. I want you to think about a person, husband or wife, child, grandchild, friend, neighbor, coworker. I don't care who it is. I just want you to pray for them. It don't cost you a thing. You just pray. And pray something like this. Now, God, speak to their hearts, and I pray they get saved. But here's what I want the Lord to pray. Pray that I, I'll have enough boldness and guts to talk about it. And, Lord, don't let my tongue get tied. I, I want to be very clear when I talk to them. And I want to tell them, dear God, I want to tell them from my heart how much I love them. And I want to spend not only the rest of this life with them, but I want to spend eternity with them one of these days. You begin to pray for them. You begin to perhaps have a conversation with them around spiritual things. By now, people have talked about the end times, all that's going on in our world. Even the non-church-going folks have talked about that. You've talked about church, and you can brag on your church. and say, well, let me tell you what my church is doing. And by the way, you begin to talk about that. You begin to invite them to church, invite them to a meal, invite them to a function, and you share your heart. You pray for a positive response. And here's the thing is you don't give up. You don't give up. Sometimes we've tried and they didn't go very well. I say, well, I'll go to the next one. No. These are people you know. I also will go people I don't know because they might be one of my brothers and sisters in Christ one day. At least invite somebody to church with you. I have many times I'll, I'll, somebody be, I'll be talking to them and maybe it's at a restaurant or at a business, something going on. And I said, where do you folks live? And I'm not really asking for an address, but just in general. I'm going to say, well, I live in wherever it is, somewhere within driving distance of our church. I said, oh, you live just close enough to come to my church. Really? Where's it at? And I told him, so, there's a church over there? <laughs> yeah, it's been here since 1964. We're about to celebrate 60 years of ministry. But I want you to come to my church sometime. And you never know. Sometimes they've said no. Sometimes they've said mm, maybe. Sometimes they've said no, thank you. But you never know at the right moment, the right time. I thank you for asking me. I'll be there Sunday. You never know. I believe God has truly given us a mountain of challenge. Again, I can't reach the masses. I can't reach everybody coming to Denton County. You can't either. As a church, we can make a dent. 
and that dent will have a name. And it may have your last name and your last name and your grandbabies. It may be the coworker that you work with closely every single day. You know about their lives. You know about their kids. You know about their everything about them. But do you know about their heart and their soul? It is truly a mountain of challenge. I want to challenge you as a church family. And we are in the, in the depths of summer. Our folks do travel some. I get that. But as school gets underway and we get in the fall, I'd like for our, us to see a specific number in our church family. Right now on a Sunday morning, we, we, between the two services, the 9 o'clock and the 1030, we have a little under 400 people shows up every Sunday. You know, there's 140,000 people in Louisville by itself. 400 people is just a drop in the bucket. But I'd like to set a goal, a challenge goal. I'd like to see by the end of the fall, we have maybe 450 in church. So, Pastor, you set numbers? I sure do. There's a whole book in the Bible called Numbers. And if you go through the book of Acts, it said, well, 3,000 got saved, 5,000 got saved. And it said God's interested in numbers because see, every number represents a person. I'd like to set a goal. Say, now, Pastor, how can we do that? Because look around, there's an empty chair right by you. Somebody you know could be sitting in that chair. Some stranger could be sitting in that chair. It's your job, not my job. It's your job to fill those chairs. My job is to equip you, train you, and motivate you to go do that. My job is to be like Jesus said, I'm going to challenge you to go do it. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Pretty simple. I'm excited to see the choir today. Boy, it's so good. The next few weeks, it's going to be explosive. It's going to grow. Our student ministry, Chuck's taking that over for the time being. It's going to be great. Children's area is doing good. We need, there's more, there's room. We, we built it. We built the building we're ready for them to come. We're ready. I need a challenge to say, well, Pastor, that's somebody else's job. No, it's not. It's mine and it's yours. A mountain of challenge. He left these men. Can you imagine their thought? Now we think, well, all they just said, oh, thank you, Lord, for that challenge. Amen for that. Don't, I don't think they said it that way. I think they were in awe as they see the resurrected Lord giving them their last words his last words to go. He challenges them, now go. I'll see you in Galilee. I'll see you at, Mount, at the mountain there. Now go. Look out across, the, that's why perhaps he used that particular mountain because you can see for miles and miles around, go to all the world and preach the gospel. Our world has come to the front door. The mission field has come to our door. And God's gonna bless us. I'm going to do my best. I hope you will too. You've heard that message before. You've heard a great commission before. It's not new. But every so often, you've got to be refreshed. You've got to be reignited, reinvigorated, and just challenged. Care about people. Would you do that? Let me pray. Our Lord, today, I believe you're challenging us even as we speak. Lord, sometimes it's easy to become comfortable and even complacent in our position with you. Forgive us of that. Lord, allow us to have a, the eyes and the heart of Jesus to look on the crowd and be, be moved as we see the people like sheep without a shepherd. As we see the harvest is widened to harvest, but yet there's not enough workers to go around. May you burden our hearts. Or there may be someone in this room today without Jesus. They've never been saved. How tragic to walk from this place and not knowing Jesus. And I pray for them today that they would stand forward and move forward and say, yes, Pastor, I want to get saved. I want to give my heart to Christ. I want to know my eternity is safe with you. I pray for that family you've brought to us to be a part of the church family, to join the church, to move their membership, that you would direct them here and nudge their hearts today. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.